Hello everyone, I'm the Old Watchman, and I'd like to share with you a few things that I was given and that I wrote down in January of this year. It has to do with the coronavirus outbreak that we're now all experiencing. Now who am I to speak to you about the coronavirus outbreak? I'm not a pastor, I'm not an author, I'm not a government official. I do work in the healthcare field. And I am the watchman. You might want to listen. The corona out, the coronavirus has exploded worldwide and expanding rapidly. And you don't need me to tell you that. We have the news media to tell us that, and they do a good job of it. But what I can tell you is, I've talked with a lot of people who are genuinely afraid. And I talk to a lot of people who are indifferent. I could care less. And in my way of thinking, and it's only my opinion, that those two stances are dangerous. Why? Well, to walk in fear exhibits a weakness in faith. To walk in indifference exhibits a lack of wisdom. You know, I've heard pastors preaching that this outbreak is fashioned by the adversary, the enemy, the devil, the God of this world who has dominion over the earth. I agree with that. I hear pastors preaching that God has no hand in this outbreak. I don't agree with that. And I'd like to draw your attention to Isaiah 45, 5 through 7, which reads, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Now, some of you are screaming, Old Covenant, some of you are screaming grace, and you can just keep right on screaming. One thing that I'm for certain is that God today is the same God that he was yesterday, and he's going to be the same God that he's going to be tomorrow. God is God. He said what he meant. He meant what he said. And I have not read anything that God or Jesus said that was later written, oops, I shouldn't have said that, or I probably shouldn't have said it that way. No, God meant what he said, even in Isaiah 45, 5 through 7. On the other hand, we have Psalm 91, and those are promises that are ours to claim, and we should claim them, but can we claim them in disobedience? No one is screaming old covenant on Psalm 91. Why is that? Now, for those of you who are bemoaning the fact that our salvation is a gift and not dependent upon our actions, but it was dependent upon the act of Christ on the cross, let me say this. I agree with you 100%. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about deliverance. And yes, Christ died on the cross for our salvation, our deliverance, our healing. But there's some obedience that comes along with that. We're talking about a blight on this earth. You want deliverance? Learn something about obedience. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's pretty straightforward. Now I've heard some people talk about all this will be over soon. And I don't know if that's true or not. But I do know this from mere observation. America, this far as a whole, still looks upon this outbreak as a major inconvenience. They have been instructed to stop going and doing as they would like. Restaurants, casinos, and bars are closing. Social events, sporting events are being canceled and postponed, and a lot of people are angry about that. It is indeed unfortunate because it has a profound economic impact upon our nation and our households. But America is yet 
as a whole to turn from their wicked ways and to pray as it is mentioned in Second Chronicles 8, 13 through 15. And that reads, If I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send a pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you'll notice there's order and process. People who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. That's order and process. That's God's order and process. America has as yet to return to her knees in repentance and prayer. America will return to obedience or she will fall. While we're at it, let's look at Second Chronicles eight twenty one through twenty two, which reads, "As far as this house which was exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house?" And they will say, Because they forsook the Lord and God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they adopted other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, He has brought this adversity upon them say God won't do that to America he did it to his people Israel America church must we be driven to our knees the coronavirus COVID-19 is no joke should we cower in fear absolutely not should we walk in mere indifference claiming faith no if wisdom is fear in disguise, then walking in indifference and calling it faith is foolhardiness in disguise. Of course we should claim our faith, but we should not be indifferent. We should walk in wisdom as well. Some have said that what is claimed as wisdom is fear in disguise. Really? Even the Lord Jesus, who was God, is God, knew the difference. In Matthew 4, 5 through 7, it reads... Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. That was a demand that Jesus cast himself down in faith. And he could have. But Jesus said, Lonnie didn't say it. The watchman didn't say it. Jesus said. On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In an older translation, it says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You see, Jesus was telling the devil that wisdom has to be factored into the decision-making process. Now, that kind of sounds like a little common sense, but a lot of wisdom, and it goes a long way. I'd like to speak briefly about our nation's leadership. Many have pointed the finger at our president and accused him of acting too slowly. That's a big truckload of horseradish. President Trump could not have stopped this outbreak, this spread, if he had wanted to. And I believe he wanted to. There were not guidelines or a program on this earth that exists to meet this onslaught. The programs that were in effect were overwhelmed by the virulence and the rapid spread of this disease. Well, I've heard people saying for years they want to see a move of God. Really? Guess what? You're seeing. God is calling people to him. God uses all things for the good of those who love him. Basically, I see portions of the book of Job, portions of the book of Judges being unfolded before our eyes. Will we curse God and die, or will we hold fast to a faithful God 
in obedience. Now, I don't care to hear your responses. I'm sure I'll receive them, and uh, that's fine. I've done a lot of praying and seeking God on this matter, and I can say that I'm not the only one thinking along these lines. There are some well-known authors, pastors, messianic rabbis who have made the same statements that I'm making, who have the same stance that I might have. God forgive me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe I am. I'm not out to sell books or increase views or protect an offering plate, which I believe should be protected. I don't believe pastors should have to protect their offering plate. I believe that our steadfastness in giving the tithe and gifts of offerings should remain now as much as ever. I know what I'm saying is not popular. But I doubt that Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Joel, and a few others were not at all popular in their day either. And understand this, I'm not claiming prophet status. No. I'm a watchman. You might want to listen. A few more things. The first instruction that we have in the Bible as far as sounding the shofar is found in the book of Numbers in chapter 10, verse 9. And it reads, when you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you will sound an alarm on the trumpets. You'll be remembered before the Lord your God and saved from your enemies. There's that order and process again. That's God's order and process. We are at war in our land. The adversary has attacked. Now I sound the alarm on the trumpets that we will be remembered before the Lord our God and saved from our enemies. For me, it is an act of faith, wisdom, and obedience. In the book of Nehemiah, as exiles had returned, the wall about Re Jerusalem was being rebuilt and neighboring kingdoms did not want to see that happen. And they were making substantial threats. The breaches in the walls were so great that a man could not shout from one breach to the next to call for help in the case of an attack at that particular breach. But a trumpet could be sounded and heard throughout the city. And Nehemiah stationed a shofarim, or trumpeter, at each breach of the wall. And Nehemiah 4.20 said, In that place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. I believe our God will still fight for us if we return to our obedience. You see, Nehemiah remembered the nation of Israel as it was leaving Egypt and the forces of Egypt were in hot pursuit and they were fearful. And Moses told them in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Now, did he mean that they were not to pray? No. They were not to speak to his fear or pray in fear. They were to speak to God in confidence and assurance. It is a practice I think we should be practicing today. Now, Ezekiel was shown a valley of dry bones in chapter 37. Verses 4 through 10, it reads, Again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. Remember that breath. It's a breath of life God gave Adam back in Genesis. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come alive. And you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and there was a no noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them. And flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, 
Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceeding the great army. As I look across the earth, I see a lot of valleys full of dry bones. The bones of the indifferent, the fearful, the proud, the uninformed, the faithful, the faithless. And I'm not talking about salvation. Israel, the valley of dry bones that Ezekiel was describing, was a nation of faith, but they had turned from their faith, God's wisdom, into disobedience. When they returned to their faith, God's wisdom and obedience, they were raised in an exceedingly great army. I believe we're seeing this unfolding today. Now, the dry bones are coming together. Sinew and flesh are growing on the bones, being covered with skin, but there is no breath in them. They don't live. What breath do they need? This breath? this breath. The Ruah is the breath of God. A wind of the Holy Spirit. That's why I sound the shofar these days. To send forth the breath and voice of God that those bones across the earth that they will live and arise an exceedingly great army. That glorifies God. The adversary has released this blight COVID-19 on the earth, and God, for the time being, has allowed it. But when the COVID-19 virus is defeated, and it will be defeated, it will be in a manner in which God is given credit and glory. It will be by supernatural means. It will still be in a manner in which glorifies God. It will be in a manner in which people will be able to say that God is still God. Remain strong in the faith. Proceed with caution and walk in wisdom. Let America turn from the slaughter of innocent, unborn pornography and serving false gods. You know, maybe that's why America is feeling so inconvenienced. They're unable to serve their gods as they want to. America, church, must we be driven to our knees? If COVID-19 shakes your faith now, how will we stand when the seven trumpets start sounding?